Hello again. Uh, so, welcome back to the latest lecture session. So, uh, we have been discussing the relevant aspects with respect to excavation or you know uh, some of the aspects or scenarios when uh, excavation cannot be uh, or is not feasible and then we moved on to looking at landfills. In that context, we were looking at a particular source, right? The one developed by the National Academies Press, uh, which was or is assessment of the performance of engineered waste containment barriers. In that context, we looked at what uh, one particular schematic or side view for a municipal solid waste landfill, right? These are what are typically required. Obviously, as we discussed uh, for hazardous waste landfill, we are going to have two uh, liner systems and municipal solid waste we are, uh, or landfills, we are only going to have or typically the law mandates that we have only one uh, or one particular liner system is good enough, right. So, let us look at some of the other aspects typically from uh, what we say the US, let us say, there the, let us look at their minimum uh, what we say uh, requirements, right. And we do have uh, similar requirements that uh, CPCB mandates and more or less those guidelines are based on the guidelines that we see he out here though, right. So, one for municipal solid waste landfill and the other for hazardous waste landfill. What do we see here? So, the waste out here and then obviously, as you see they say that uh, the protective layer below the waste is optional, but typically one would uh, what we say suggest having that, right, because you do not want to damage this particular leachate collection system and also this liner out here. So, then as we discuss, we have the geotextile separation layer where the fine particles are going to be prevented from moving uh, what we say or seeping down into and clogging the leachate collection systems. So, that is what we have here and around 30 centimeter thick what do we say leachate collection system. So, typically granular collection uh, what do we say uh, uh, gravel here and then perforated pipes out here and then some sand out here at the bottom let us say, right. So, sand out here typically at the bottom right and then the perforated pipes and then the gravel obviously all around right and beneath that obviously you are going to have different kinds of liners here uh, we are talking about a geo membrane liner right and then again compacted or impermeable layer again that of around 60 centimeters uh, beneath that particular HDPE or the geo membrane uh, liner now right. So, this is for the landfill what do we have for the uh, uh, hazardous waste landfill now. So, obviously the waste and similar to the relevant particular uh, protective layer we are going to have uh, what do we say an optional protective layer similar to the municipal solid waste landfill. And again similar to the municipal solid waste, waste landfill we are going to have the primary leachate collection system and then the HDPE membrane or geo membrane liner right. But typically from what I have seen in India let us say rather than immediately having this leachate uh, detection system or leak detection system pardon me, uh, they typically have what we say clay layer here of a few centimeters thick a compacted clay layer of a few centimeters thick, right, uh, maybe 45 centimeters or so thick and then beneath that they have this leak detection system, right, of again around uh, 15 or 30 centimeters thick here. So, typically 30 centimeters and then clay of around 45 centimeter thick, right, and then the secondary liner and then they have the compacted clay that is what I have observed in a few landfills in uh, India anyway. Again, uh, CPCB has its own guidelines, but more or less they are from this particular, uh, these guidelines from the uh, US and I think it is from the RCRE or the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, right. So, this is what we have. And then uh, for obviously the cover systems or final cover systems, obviously that is remarkably important because these landfills are supposed to, uh, what do we say, uh, stay out there for hundreds of uh, years, if not obviously more. So, obviously you do not want to have uh, what do you say your rainfall uh, seeping through your hazardous waste and leading to greater leachate generation or you know relevant issues out there. So, typically obviously you are going to have vegetation out there right again that I was I saw that that particular vegetation uh, actually what do we say led to greater uh, what do we say loss of water through evapotranspiration that is something that uh, some interesting data that I saw earlier as in without vegetation the loss of rate of loss of water from the surface was relatively lower and actually when you had some kind of vegetation, but I cannot remember which kind, you know the due to evapotranspiration the relevant rate of loss of water was actually higher. And then you have the uh, erosion layer or vegetative to soil as we see here again around 15 centimeter thick and flexible geomembrane liner. So, another liner at the top obviously and then the infiltration barrier and then the waste right or the hydraulic barrier let us say and typically that seems to be around 45 centimeters thick. So, for hazardous waste landfills what do we have same case as the erosion layer 
but then a granular filter and then a biotic filter obviously right you know but again in Indian context I do not see people going with this and then a cover drainage layer obviously right you want to collect any particular water that comes through this particular layers let us say right cover drainage layer and then another liner here obviously and then the GCL or the geosynthetic clay liner typically this is the HDPE let us say and then again soil and then a foundation again I do not see this a lot in the Indian context and then the hazardous waste. So, typically what do we see in the Indian context an erosion layer, a granular filter, a cover drainage layer and these two kinds of liners or at least one and then the clay and then the relevant uh, hazardous waste out here right. These are the final covers as in I am closing down the landfill and I need to obviously cap the landfill and this is the kind of cover that I need to have and obviously as you see it is around one and a half to two meter uh, thick uh, cover though, right. So, again let us uh, move on. So, obviously uh, you know we looked at uh, you know very briefly anyway the different kinds of uh, uh, layers that we need to have beneath the landfill and or beneath the waste and above the waste and typically let us say let us just try to understand what are the usual causes let us say that lead to failure of different landfills right uh, and what do we have here? Here we have the different kinds of components let us say or variables that failed and here we have prevalence of the problem yes and what do we say what is it attributed to is it the design the construction or operation that led to failure of the relevant system. So, as you can see you know landfill liner construction is a major case right and typically during construction obviously you know it failed a lot right. So, when you are placing the liner let us say you need to be remarkably uh, what do we say uh, cautious or you know uh, you have or uh, higher experienced uh, what do we say operators because typically from what I have seen where they have the seams let us say you know you are not going to have one liner to cover the all the landfill. So, you are going to have to weld the liners together and typically they do the vacuum test or pressure test let us say as an you know is the pressure dropping uh, uh, what do we say over uh, this particular seam or such right. They introduce some pressure let us say or maintain some pressure and see if the pressure drops after certain few minutes and such and same case with vacuum they try to see look at that particular integrity. But to my knowledge you know only randomly are these seams uh, looked at in India as in not all the seams are tested randomly they are tested. But obviously you know for greater uh, factor of uh, safety or to be on safer side we should or one should promote what we say such testing at all the relevant seams. That is one aspect that the relevant liners fail at a lot and other than that let us say depending on how you are uh, laying the liner and what you are laying above the liner even during construction itself or at the stage of construction itself you can damage the liner let us say as again what is the thickness we are talking about around a few mm thick 2 mm thick let us say right. And then as, as you you know load the relevant uh, materials over that as in the leach, uh, leachate collection system or so on and then your waste let us say or at least during construction right. So, the leachate collection system you are going to have puncturing the relevant liner or such. And the other aspect is obviously liner degradation a different aspects as in let us say a liner is not compatible to the relevant uh, type of uh, contaminants or let us say you know the quality of the liner has degraded because of its uh, exposure to sunlight or due to extreme temperatures high and low temperatures and so on and so forth. So, those are some aspects and another aspect is obviously landfill liner systems stability right and obviously here you see that the liner system stability let us say is uh, of considerable importance and the issue is typically with design let us say landfill liner system stability. And then more obviously cover system stability that fails a lot as you see the cover system stability and again issues with respect to design let us say right. So, typically construction in some cases and considerable cases it is due to the faulty uh, design let us say right. So, let us just try to have a overview obviously you can go through these other aspects to see what are the common uh, causes for uh, liner failure now not liner failure pardon me uh, issues with uh, landfill right. So, here we see that this is with respect to the type of uh, failure let us say. So, uh, most aspects are with respect to stability or displacement let us say right typically of the liner right and again along the slopes. So, here you have the leachate collection and removal system and the leak, uh, leak detection system right this is the primary and the secondary one and so during uh, either malfunction or operation typically let us say uh, malfunction is because let us say the design was poor or your de you do not have a geotextile layer. So, that your fine particles do not seep through and block your or uh, what do we say leachate collection systems. So, that is something that uh, you need to look at obviously right and obviously degradation of the relevant uh, components 
and during construction itself considerable issues. But obviously as we see stability and displacement of your relevant components uh, form a considerable uh, what we say uh, fraction of uh, the failures now. So with respect to the principal human factor as you see a majority of the relevant failures are due to poor design and then issues due to improper construction or improper care during construction and some due to operation. So obviously as we see you know design and construction are remarkably important and again especially with respect to the stability of the relevant components right. So that is something to uh, keep in mind let us say when you m might either uh, look at evaluating a landfill or you know going about uh, designing a landfill let us say right. So let us uh, move on here. So liquid collection rates for double liner uh, leak detection systems. So recently when I was evaluating a landfill due to some particular issues and such I wanted to know let us say uh, what are the expected rates right as in initially I have this particular leachate collection system or the primarily primary leachate collection system pardon me and beneath I have the secondary leachate collection system or the leak detection, detection system. So for a given particular landfill given its characteristics and such I want to know let us say you know the relevant data that is being provided by the uh, landfill operator is that uh, you know does that seem uh, fine or is that unusual as in does that point to any particular failure or such right. So for that I just looked at some data out here. So what do we have here you know different kinds of uh, systems one is just the geomembrane one is the sand geomembrane and compacted clay and the other is sand geomembrane and this geosynthetic clay liner or typically the HDPE liner. And then we have the initial rate and active rate and then the post closure rate okay. Post closure as in I am done with the relevant uh, what do you say the landfill is at its full capacity I cap the landfill and you, you know that is the post closure rate that I am looking at where am I looking at that is in the leak detection systems or the liquid collection systems let us say liner detection systems leak detection systems right. And initial rate as in let us say I just constructed the landfill right and I am just starting to operate my particular landfill and then whenever there is rainfall let us say obviously you know all this particular rainfall typically let us say depending upon how you constructed your particular landfill is going to end up as leachate let us say right. So you are going to typically expect considerable levels of leachate generated during that particular initial period and even during the active period as in as you keep moving up let us say right uh, until you reach the particular soil or the you know uh, surface uh, level you are going to still have considerable levels of what we say leachate generated and that is what typically or you know during or until you close the particular landfill you are going to have this active rate. So let us look at that. So let us look at the mean typically right mean during the active rate or initial rate is considerably higher as you expect when compared to the active rate and the post closure rate right. So after post closure too you see that there is still considerable what do we say uh, uh, volume of uh, the uh, leachate being generated here you have liters per hectare per day right. But obviously uh, the one in the initial period is almost twice or more than twice of what you would see or expect in the post closure rate right. So that is something to keep in mind and more importantly you see that you know there is a great variation right in the uh, amount of uh, leachate that is detected in this leachate collection system. What are we looking at? We are looking at the leak detection system, the secondary system. And that is the uh, where we are expecting or you know we are observing these levels of uh, leachate being collected. And as you see you know considerable variation 2144 liters per hectare per day and the other around 4. Why is that? Obviously because of let us say uh, monsoon and non-monsoon seasons or periods of rainfall and so on and so forth. And that is something obviously you see and obviously post closure rate you see that the maximum is not uh, pretty high right. It is more or less you know, relatively nearer to the mean. So in the case of this geosynthetic uh, pardon me geomembrane and compacted clay let us say obviously now I have a greater protection let us say and thus I would expect that the rate of infiltration of this particular leachate into the leachate detection system let us say is going to be relatively lower right and that is why you see that let us say here the average is 307 and here 114 let us say right and same case here for during the active rate and during the post closure rate right and more importantly the maximum too is relatively less. So why is that important let us say that the, I look at the maximum as in the your leachate collection system has a limited capacity as in it can only pump out let us say a given amount of uh, leachate per uh, time let us say right. So if you are ending up 
uh, you know, if you are unable to let's say withdraw that leachate that's piling up in your particular leachate collection system you are obviously going to have issues now so thus let's say you know you need to be able to balance your particular design of the leachate collection system right and the leachate uh, what do we say disposal system or treatment system with the maximum amount of leachate that you expect to infiltrate through to your particular uh, leachate collection system that's something to keep in mind and obviously when i have this geo synthetic clay liner i see that it's uh, pretty less right but more or less on the same lines along the sand geomembrane and gcl but typically you see that the maximum is relatively attenuated and even in during the active rate let's say it's considerably less and here during post closure almost zero right obviously geosynthetic clay liner you know has uh, what do we say little to no uh, what do we say hydraulic connectivity doesn't let uh, water uh, go through typically let's say unless you have punctures and such but some compounds might diffuse but i'm not uh, greatly sure which compounds but uh, you know you, some can diffuse though, right so this is something to keep in mind let's say you are evaluating a landfill and you see that you, at particular stage let's say during your initial rate let's say you see a particular uh, what we say rate of collection of uh, leachate then you can at least as a thumb rule to see if uh, you know you, whether your landfill is operating at uh, what we say the normal uh, level or are there any failures that you need to be concerned about you can look at these general data let's say uh, that we have out here to evaluate let's say at a preliminary level anyway whether your landfill is still has some integrity or has it failed now right so that's something to look at and source again keep in mind that this is again from the relevant uh, document that i talked about earlier so here leachate collection and removal system at a landfill in pennsylvania so what do we have here now this is obviously a municipal soil waste in landfill this is from the leak detection system though the secondary landfill right so what do you see let's say during this particular period of initial period you see that the leachate detected is considerably high right leachate detected in the initial rate uh, initial period right is considerably high and then during the active period we not a lot and obviously post closure maybe uh, none at all right this is from municipal solid waste uh, uh, landfill though i guess with they where they have two uh, leachate collection systems right and here we have one for leachate collection and removal system this is not the leachate detection system keep that in mind this is the primary uh, leachate uh, collection and removal system so obviously as you see here initial periods you see uh, you know considerable quantities of here we do have the relevant uh, periods of operation highlighted so initial periods we see that you know considerable amount of leachate is generated right almost uh, what is it now 12,685 they say uh, liters in this particular month maybe right you can break that down and during active period right still considerable volume but not as much as during the relevant uh, initial period and then during post closure right and keep in mind that in uh, municipal soil waste landfill you are going to have microbial activity and so on and so forth right and also let's say uh, as you are uh, due to compaction let's say you know you are going to have also uh, moisture or water coming out of your particular uh, uh, you know waste and also uh, degradation byproducts could be water right you know different uh, cases out here right so again initial period considerable concentrations not concentrations volumes of leachate generated and that's something one needs to keep in mind when you are designing your leachate uh, collection and removal systems right there's something to keep in mind there so again uh, what are the typical leakage rates for a single geomembrane and composite liner let's say right so if as i mentioned you during construction you can have uh, you know uh, holes let's say or punctures in your particular uh, liner system so here let's say for different what do we say uh, holes frequency per hectare obviously we are going to look at the relevant uh, leakage rate in liters per hour per day so for single geomembrane and composite liners or the hdpe liners let's say right so here let's say obviously there is nothing and still obviously you are going to have some particular leakage and then for one uh, hole per hectare you see that the leakage in your particular geomembrane liner based uh, what do we say uh, leachate uh, uh, what do we say uh, collection and not collection part me the impermeable layers which are if they are only single geomembrane layers obviously you still have or you will have considerable leakage rates even when you have one hole per hectare now right so keep that in mind but for composite liners obviously we see that it's relatively less 
Again same case the greater the number of holes in your particular liners the greater the uh, what we say uh, leakage rate but typically for composite liners relatively less. Again these are uh, these data you can use to let us say understand let us say uh, how uh, well was the relevant liner uh, constructed and such and so on and so forth to analyze your uh, landfill if you detect any issues after uh, you know or during operation let us say right. So that is something that uh, we look at. So let us move on to I think uh, failures here. So different types of failure let us look at that. So one case is let us say you know here is the slope and here is the uh, what do we say the bottom of your particular landfill right. So depending upon uh, the kind of uh, slopes and the material out here we have side slope and base failure as in the whole thing just rotates out here right that is what you see out here or shallow or infinite slope out here too right. So different kinds of uh, slope failure here one is the side wall. So obviously you know the people from uh, with uh, geotechnical background are relevant here as in when you need to construct the landfill you also need to analyze the side slope stability now right that is something of considerable importance. So the second case is when you know the liner is pulled out from the anchor trench as I mentioned we need to have an anchor trench as in this liner needs to go through or under this particular anchor trench right. So this is the anchor trench. So depending upon the stability of this particular liner component and this particular uh, trench let us say right you are going to have to look at the relevant calculations with respect to liner slippage and so on and so forth and typically let us say if you do not design that well again you are going to have pull out of the liner or liner coming out from underneath the trench. So that is something that is another cause of this particular failure right. Let us move on to the other aspect obviously failure through the waste pile the waste itself can shift let us say here you have the liner and the waste can obviously have uh, what do we say the relevant uh, what do we say uh, uh, non-uniform pressures being exerted and through that particular case again you can have relevant uh, failure again. Again so failure through the waste liner and foundation probably one of the more uh, worst case uh, scenarios out here right. So here a soft foundation right you see that uh, you know again non-uniform distributions let us say and again issues with respect to stability. So here this is typically the worst case of uh, failure that you would see out here and this kind of failure typically we, uh, we do observe as in when you pile up uh, waste uh, you know in a non-uniform manner and what do we see the, that uh, where what do we observe then failure by sliding along the landfill liner system. So let us say if I do not have uh, relatively more uniform distribution of my waste and I pile it up along sides uh, and my slope is relatively high I can have this failure by this particular waste sliding along right. So lateral translation of the waste flow that is something that can cause issues out here in the liner now as this waste shifts let us say right. So that is something to keep in mind and uh, let us move on to other uh, kinds of aspect at the microscopic level. So again let us say for uh, shallow slope right and here you have the relevant uh, waste you can have let us say shear in this particular uh, what do we say uh, liner this is the side view obviously and this red particular liner is the geotextile liner right and as you can see you are going to have separation of uh, this relevant particular liner or shear in the liner due to stresses in the settlement of the waste or during the settlement of uh, waste. As I mentioned here let us say if you just take the liner up without the proper uh, what we say layers protecting this liner and you know different stresses let us say that can lead to the relevant shear and failure of the relevant liner. And again let us say depending upon obviously the steep slope too way too steep a slope right and then you are going to have obviously have again shearing of liner and why is that because of lack of support again bulging of the liner here right. So different uh, ways of uh, failure and I think this is a common cause at least in uh, the Indian context at least right and keep in mind that once you you know start piling up the waste it is near to impossible to or not even feasible let us say to dig out the waste and such and then look at uh, the behavior of the relevant or the state of the relevant liner and so on and so forth. So the design is uh, one remarkably important aspect obviously relevant to both and are uh, obviously requiring the involvement of both environmental engineers and uh, geotechnical engineers let us say or engineers with geotechnical background right. So let us uh, move on. So again uh, mechanisms for local side slope integrity failure right. So uh, until now we have looked at uh, landfills in general and some of the uh, cases or aspects that we need to keep in mind right. So the next aspect that we are going to look at obviously is containment right. 
So as in let's say if I do not want to excavate the waste and take it to some other location and either treat it or dispose it in a landfill or you know I can't treat the relevant waste at the particular site due to various reasons let's say what can I do? I can try to see to it that this particular waste is not transported or the compounds are not transported to uh, different locations or you know uh, to a wide area let's say. So one aspect is we can look at containment. Right. So, typically we are looking at different barrier materials let us say right. So, again uh, we have looked at excavation, we have looked at landfills and we are now looking at containment let us say we are just trying to contain the relevant waste right. So, uh, different uh, barrier materials are out there, but typically what is it that we are looking at with respect to uh, choosing let us say a particular barrier material let us say we are or what are the characteristics of the barrier materials that we need to be concerned about right. So, here we are preventing or trying to prevent the transport of the contaminant from one location to the other right. So, there are two modes of transport obviously what are they one is the advective transport or by advection and the other by diffusion let us say right diffusion and or dispersion let us say right. So, there are two kinds of fluxes or you know flux is nothing but mass per area per time flux j what is that mass of the contaminant or compound per area per time let us say right. So, I have two kinds of uh, fluxes here one is due to advection let us say Kca is due to advection and the flux due to advection is equal to what now? It is going to be equal to your Darcy's velocity into the concentration of your relevant uh, compound and again what is Darcy's velocity or how can I get that? That is going to be equal to hydraulic conductivity times the slope of your energy gradient or hydraulic gradient let us say right uh, or the energy gradient the slope of that particular uh, gradient now right. So, u equal to Ki, K is the hydraulic conductivity right. So, Kic so again what is advection now let us say if ground water or water is flowing through let us say in this context water is flowing through the relevant uh, particular pores let us say and then you are going to have the contaminant also transported along with this net flow of this particular ground water let us say. So, in that case I am going to have uh, what we say transport of the contaminant due to advection now. Again hydraulic conductivity will depend upon both the media and also the type of uh, fluid that you have right. So, let us say this is also a function of uh, it is going to be a function of intrinsic permeability or permeability of that particular media and also the viscosity of that particular fluid now right. So, this is or depend upon or the hydraulic conductivity pardon me is depend upon both the media and the fluid now k here is the intrinsic uh, permeability and mu is the relevant viscosity let us say. Again uh, we do not need to go into greater detail here, but what is this uh, flux here now? it is uh, the Darcy's velocity times the concentration that is equal to Kic right. So, that is due to the advection now. So, what is it due to diffusion now or how much of the contaminant will be transported by diffusion or in the case of the subsoil let us say where we have we are also going to have dispersion because of the tortuosity of the relevant uh, or tortuous path that is available to the relevant water molecules now right. So, uh, how does this uh, diffu diffusion go about? I think we discussed this or mentioned this a lot of times, but typically let us say in one location you have higher concentration of a particular compound in another location let us say you have lower concentration of the compound right. So, then again typically potentials let us say you are going to have what do we say this particular diffusion driving the comp contaminant transport from a particular location where it is at higher concentration to a particular location where it is at a lower concentration. So, diffusion what we would want to do? it would want to see to it that the concentration is the same at all the locations. So, the compound would uh, travel from a particular uh, location where the concentration is higher to a particular location where the concentration is lower or you know it drives it in that particular uh, what do we say uh, uh, direction let us say right. But keep in mind that diffusion is again random though. So, again diffusion, so what is the flux due to diffusion though right. So, typically we know that it is d dc by dx right. Here we are assuming that it is in one direction right that is a decent assumption out here, but as we see that you know 
uh, you are going to typically have diffusion only through the pores right only through the pores let us say and how can I reflect this uh, normalized uh, diffusion coefficient not diffusion coefficient my pardon me this uh, normalized flux right say due to uh, diffusion with the uh, diffusion only through the pores right how can I get that so, that will be equal to the porosity times the one due to uh, what do we say through the pores let us say right yes that is what I am going to have as in this calculates let us say what does this calculate mass per mass of the contaminant being transported per area of the pores per time right. So, if I multiply that by porosity right area of the pores if I can think of that let us say or fraction of the pores by total uh, area let us say right total area. So, I then end up with this particular flux normalized flux let us say right. So, that is going to be equal to porosity times the flux through the pores right and what is this particular, uh, particular uh, variable now. So, J d is equal to porosity times the flux due to, to the pores and how can I calculate that as I know it is going to be depend upon the diffusion coefficient and concentration gradient right. What is this d c by d x giving you an idea about as in a part, along a particular dimension let us say what is the change in concentration obviously if the change in concentration is high or the slope is high let us say with respect to the uh, contaminant concentration obviously the diffusion flux will be greater right. And if there is only a small change in concentration from one location to the other along that particular dimension obviously, the flux is going to be relatively lesser that is what you see out here right. So, the greater the change in concentration along that particular dimension the greater the flux in that particular dimension. But one aspect we need to keep in mind is that as we discuss here let us say if these are the soil particles right these are the soil particles and as the compound comes in here it does not go through like this right because you are going to have soil all out here and the ground water will you know or the compound can travel in different directions or will end up traveling in different directions. So, while this distance might be x right it might actually or it will actually end up traveling a distance of tau x this tau is called the tortuosity factor right. So, typically rather than traveling just this particular distance of x because of tortuosity it is going to travel a greater distance which we are going to represent by tau x right. So, if I put that in here that is going to be equal to the diffusion coefficient times d c by tau d x right. So, that is going to be equal to d e or dispersivity let us say d c by d x right. So, now plugging this back in I am going to have g d is equal to minus porosity times this particular d e times d c by d x right. So, this is the flux due to uh, dispersion and diffusion let us say right. This is the dispersion coefficient which also includes the uh, or takes into account the tortuosity factor or the tortuous path of this particular contaminant and also the diffusion coefficient and uh, this is the porosity right. And why is it negative because we know that the concentrate the diffusion drives the transport of the contaminant from a region where the concentration is higher to a region where the concentration is lower right. So, and what did we have for advection that is going to be equal to u into c right. So, I guess I am running out of time. So, in the next session we will just look at a particular or you know plug in a few values for these particular variables as in for porosity uh, dispersion coefficient and so on and so forth and look at let us say how do the let us say these two fluxes compare. As in if it is surface water as in a river or such let us say you know the let us say you drop some dye or color in that particular uh, surface water. You can obviously visually see that you know the dye is being transported let us say, but if it is subsurface obviously the ground water flow velocities will be relatively slow uh, let us say a few meters per year right. So, in that context right what is it uh, both advection and diffusion play an important role, but in surface waters let us say when uh, the speed of this particular uh, fluid let us say or uh, the velocity of flow of that particular fluid is relatively high only advection is important and diffusion is negligible in such a case right. So, that is something to keep in mind, but obviously in these barrier systems what are we trying to do or in these containment systems we are trying to decrease the flux due to advection we are trying to decrease that as much as we can 
right. So then we are going to just plug in a few values and compare the typical uh, what do we say uh, rates of transport through the barrier as in even when you put a barrier you still have diffusion driving through the relevant particular transport of the contaminant and advection will be less but it will not be zero. So let us just try to see how they compare and what are the relevant values and I guess with that I will end today's session and uh, thank you.